for joining us for another episode of Conference Stories from Special Collections. My name is Anka Voss and I'm the curator of the William Monroe Special Collections here at the Concord Free Public Library. We're honored to have our, as our guest today, John Hansen, who will present to us The Stones Cry Out, Epitaphs Carved by Ithmar Spalden of Concord. John is a Berkshire's native and business executive in Cambridge. He is the author of a soon be released book, Reading the Gravestones of Old New England, available from McFarland Books or from your local independent bookstore. John has been collecting and studying early New England epitaph verse for years and has given numerous presentations and written several articles on the subject of his epitaph research. In his talk today, he will share some representative verse from local gravestones and discuss their sources, including scripture, hymnody, lyric poetry, and epitaphs made to order for a particular individual. The presentation will consider these epitaphs in the context of the work of one 18th century concrete stone carver, Ithamar Spalding, in his remarkably detailed account book preserved here in the William Monroe Special Collections at the Concord Free Public Library. Congratulations on your upcoming book and welcome, John. I'm so glad that you could join us here today. Thank you for that very warm introduction, Anka. I'm delighted to be with you and your viewers today. Um, in the course of my work that you described so well, I became intrigued in two basic questions. Uh, where did these verses come from and how did they get onto these gravestones? On the first question, I've been able to identify a lot of the source texts, and I'll be talking about that in the, uh, this morning. Uh, on the second question, I've been researching the decisions and transactions involved in taking words from a source text and converting them into inscriptions on stone. This has led me deep into the world of the stone carvers and straight to Ithamar Spalden of Concord. Spalding was born in Pepperell in 1767. Between about 1794 and 1800, he lived and worked as a stonemason here in Concord. During that time, he kept this detailed book of accounts, which as you said, now resides with you here in the Concord Library. It provides a marvelous window into the business of carving gravestones. So what I'd like to do is to introduce you to some of the different types of epitaph you'll find in Concord as they appear in Spalding's work and in his account book. The first category of epitaph I always talk about is what I simply call the classic. Here's a perfect example carved by Spalding from over in Lincoln. Does it sound familiar? As you are now, so once was I, as I am now, so you must be. This epitaph appears all over New England. You can't swing a cat in these old burial grounds without hitting some version of it. The origin of this verse is actually lost in time. Uh, the same message was carved on roadside Roman tombs and a version appears on the grave of the Black Prince in Canterbury Cathedral. So why was this particular message chosen so often in New England graveyards? because it conveyed a specific and critically important message for these early Congregationalists. It isn't about having your affairs in order or your will up to date. Preparing one's soul for a death that could come at any moment was an urgent, well-understood task for these people, preached in every pulpit and central to everyone's private devotional reading. To die unprepared in a state of sin would result in eternal damnation in a very real hell. Now, this was a time of fierce theological disputes between old light traditionalists and new light revivalists about how to prepare for death, but there was no disagreement at all about the need to prepare. So for contemporary readers, there would have been nothing trite or commonplace about this choice of epitaph. Here's another example by Spalding over in Carlisle. It's precisely the same message, but with a very slight variation in the verse. To me, this is a clue that Spalding didn't have a single shop version of the classic, though he'd certainly know it by heart. 
but rather each epitaph was chosen by the customer who might know or prefer a slightly different phrasing. One thing I'll mention that you'll see throughout this talk is the irony of the first person, that I in these epitaphs. Clearly, the stone is meant to convey the voice of William Green himself talking to us, and perhaps he picked the epitaph before he died, but I believe this would usually have been the exception, not the rule. Death often came quickly and prematurely in these towns. After all, Green was only 21. Uh, not everyone would have planned carefully ahead. So in all likelihood, it fell to the bereaved survivors or their minister to choose an epitaph. A second common source of epitaphs is scripture. Here's a Spalding example from the Old Hill Burying Ground here in Concord. Um, it's no surprise that I see scripture often. These were familiar texts. Everyone had been hearing these lines preached in sermons all their lives, and they're comfortably orthodox. Who could argue with quoting the Bible on the grave of a loved one? And they were also near to hand. A pulpit Bible could be found in every church, and there was usually a family Bible in most homes. As a result, you'll find passages from the Psalms, Job, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, or the Gospels in any of these burial grounds. This particular passage that Spalding carved is from the Beatitudes of St. Matthew. It's a bit of an interesting choice. Maybe there's a backstory reference about why those who knew uh, Charles Miles considered him to be poor in spirit. Uh, I don't know, I'll have to research further with Concord historians. Now, the rich language of 18th century psalms and hymns provided another common source of epitaphs, and they are well represented in Spalding's work. These verses would also have been familiar to the deceased, their surviving families, the stone carver, and of course, the minister. They were not just sung in church, they were read, memorized, and recited at home. Here's an example from Carlisle. Note up above, by the way, the fine eulogistic text listing all the exemplary congregationalist virtues. Um, it's not unusual. Um, and I would emphasize this is not just to pay respect to the dead, but to serve as, as an example as a call to action for the rest of us. Now, as for the verse, at first reading, this quatrain doesn't sound too hopeful, does it? There's no mention of the resurrection, just sort of a, a round trip from dirt to dust. Now, does anyone recognize the verse? The source is the Psalms and hymns of Isaac Watts. In this case, a hymn based on a passage from the book of Job. Uh, if anyone wants to pause the video to read the full text, uh, please do. I, I won't read the entire thing. Um, I will say, though, that Watts was an English minister, popular hymn writer, often called the father of English hymnody. He wrote some 750 hymns, many of which still remain in use today. Watts's hymns were incredibly popular choices for these epitaphs, as were his poems. I really can't overstate this. He was a major part of essentially every New Englander's church going and their home devotional reading. Now, read in context, the message of Simon Blood's epitaph takes on a whole different meaning. Watts's message is all about the importance of submission to God's will and of turning away from the short favors of this vain and transitory world and concentrating instead on crowning our lives with God's smiling mercy. I am highly confident that contemporary readers would have read this epitaph, recognized the hymn from just the four lines and understood its full meaning. So I think there was very little ambiguity to the contemporary reader. Here's another Watts hymn from here in Concord in the Old Hill Burying Ground. Um, once again, the passage carved on the stone as such does not seem very uplifting, though we can assume the questions are rhetorical, 
and that for Lucy Porter, the answers will be no, no, no. And indeed, uh, the entire Watts hymn, which is subtitled clearly enough, Triumph Over Death in Hope of the Resurrection, is a marvelous affirmation of Christian faith. Notice as you read it how Watts shows us the swift, dramatic transition from corruption, earth, and worms to God triumphant in the skies. It's a very popular hymn for epitaphs. In the course of my research, I found each verse used as an epitaph in one graveyard or another. Uh, I really especially admire the confidence of that last verse in which Watts places the whole congregation, all of us, securely in heaven. What a comforting message for Lucy Porter's survivors to read uh, or to recall when they came to her gravestone. I have found some other Watts hymns and uh, on other Carver's stones here in Concord, but somewhat to my surprise, I've not found any epitaphs quoting John Wesley or other 18th century hymn writers among Spalding's work. I think I have some more looking to do around Concord and the environs. Okay, in addition to familiar and orthodox sources like the classic or scripture or hymnody, there are many other epitaphs with origins you might not expect to see used in these early New England burial grounds. For example, I found more than a century's worth of English and American poetry from lyric to Augustine to romantic to satiric. Some of the work of enduringly famous writers like Shakespeare, Milton, Alexander Pope, Robbie Burns, and Samuel Johnson. Other sources were famous in their own time, but are now entirely forgotten. I've actually found very few examples of poetry in Concord compared to other uh, towns I've studied, but thankfully, Ithamar Spalding carved one of the very best. Uh, this stone is in the Hill Burial Ground. The epitaph is from Alexander Pope's Elegy to the Memory of an Unfortunate Lady. This was a popular choice of verse. I found it used in Lancaster and as far away as Chester on the other side of the Connecticut River. This recurrence across time and distance, incidentally, suggests it must have been anthologized and distributed all across the early Commonwealth. Pope was a Catholic poet and satirist. He's best known today for The Rape of the Lock, The Dunciad, and his translations of Homer. His wonderful rhyming couplets, heroic couplets, with their elegant meter and superbly polished diction are very distinctive. Uh, I've come to a, regarding Watts, when I find a wonderful smooth rhyme that's A, B, A, B, my first instinct is Watts. If it's A, A, B, B, my first instinct is Pope. And I'm usually correct. It's an interesting selection when you stop to read it, a very solemn admonishment to humility. Note, by the way, how the deceased, or at least the person who selected the verse, interjects their own voice in that last line, all that I shall be. In the original, the line reads, tis all thou art and all the proud shall be. But as I mentioned, this is the work of, that, that little edit is the work of whoever selected this verse, not Stone himself. Uh, he died suddenly, as we read above in the stone in the bloom of life. This stone in Concord South Burying Ground, right next to the Bank of America, introduces another category of epitaph that appears often in Spalding's work. It's what I call bespoke, a composition that is unique to a particular death and the work of a single anonymous writer. I can only speculate on who composed any one of these, who commissioned them, and what their rela relationship might have been with the deceased. This one, to be honest, it's not a great piece of poetry. The scansion is a little awkward, and the phrasing is a little choppy. If you read it aloud, it doesn't really flow. Still, it's a heartfelt and respectable original composition 
by someone well-read enough to use images like the this lonesome cave and a husband dear, a parent near, an interesting choice of words, and, and to at least try to emulate something that sounds like a Watts hymn. I'm guessing it's a friend of John Barrett, maybe a surviving son or daughter. Uh, I, I don't really suppose I'll ever know. But compare Barrett's epitaph to another bespoke one, uh, this in Lincoln. This strikes me as a superior piece of writing compared to John Barrett's stone. It's not the same author, and therefore, Spalding was not creating these himself. The first three lines ha have an interesting, steady, structure structured progression. Yesterday, today, tomorrow and in parallel, three contrasting states, active life, clod of dirt, and an escape, in, uh, escape from darkness, all climaxing with this wonderful winging away to be with God in heaven. And note that this directly echoes the line from above about the full hope of a glorious resurrection. Um, I'm assuming that this link suggests the same person composed the eulogy above and the verse below. But again, I, I just sense a very different author's voice to, the, to Barrett's. And here's yet another bespoke, this one in Pepperell. There's a lot to unpack here. Start with the image on the tympanum, the round part above. Spalding carved little uh, two-year-old Aaron Bowers and two of the stock or stack of boards that fell and crushed him to death. He adds this ornamental scroll across the top. Memento mori can be translated as either remember death or recall that you will die. Either way, a fitting call for the reader to ponder the lesson of the transience of life and the prospects of eternity to come. Note, by the way, there's another little bit of Latin down here AET or aetatus, meaning at the age of. The verse is an amazing piece of work. It's almost like a little sermon, taking as its text a passage from the first epistle of John, uh, chapter 5, verse 21, which reads, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. But here, this reverses the role of the child and the adult. The unfortunate toddler is admonishing his parents to stop their inappropriate grieving and resign themselves to God's will. And by the way, that threat of God frowning upon you is deadly serious. For a religious reader of the time, to be frowned upon by God is understood to mean to perish forever. And again, of course, these are not little Aaron's words. They're the work of yet another now anonymous local writer. I do think this is a moving example of the original creativity these people were capable of summoning in order to express their attitudes towards life and death. But there is no reason to conclude that it came from the pen of Ithamar Spalding. Now on that note, before I go into the next couple of categories of epitaph, let me bring in Spalding's notebook. Uh, as I mentioned, this is really a remarkable document, and you are very lucky to have it here in Concord. Um, notice the title in the upper right, Book of Accounts and Proceedings from April 13th, 1795. Very specific start time. You can almost see him writing this and then practicing his handwriting several times. Uh, he was obviously very proud of his script. Why this big doodle of London and then two small ones? I don't know. Uh, I have no reason to believe he ever went to London. Perhaps he's daydreaming of future travels. This is an important document. It's very well known amongst gravestone scholars. Yes, that is a field and a thriving one. Uh, the Association for Gravestone Studies puts out a scholarly journal and there are at least two articles over time that make extensive reference to Spalding and his notebook. 
It's an important source of data on the backdating of stones. That is the time lag between the date of death and when the stone was completed, which was often a matter of several years. Also the cost of his carving services and the overall business of quarrying and carting gravestones. By the way, carving was just one way Spalding earned his living. As we'll see, he had a number of other enterprises going at the same time. Uh, he also was not above taking the occasional well-earned break. The phrase, did but little in the afternoon, appears from time to time in this book. For me, it really brings alive the context, the daily context in which these epitaphs were commissioned and carved. For example, here we are in April, 1798. Ephraim Miriam ordered a pair of stones for his wife for $11. A pair, by the way, is headstone and footstone. Uh, this D or DR abbreviation, I I'm not positive, I'm not a CPA, but this is the left-hand side of the ledger and it must be some symbol or abbreviation for debit, what his customers owe him, $11. Uh, when they paid, the matching credit was entered on the right-hand page or as here with a notation saying paid in the margin. Also, while we're on this page, note Spalding's masonry work, making a hearthstone for Joseph Mulliken, uh, for $3.60 and then laying that hearthstone for 33 cents. Uh, but back to Ephraim Merriam. Here's the finished product in the old hill burying ground. Um, retire, my friends, dry up your tears. We'll talk about that verse in a moment. Uh, incidentally, notice that Ephraim Merriam, who commissioned Spalding to carve this stone, must have been Abigail's son or brother-in-law. We can tell that Abigail outlived her husband, Nathan, so he couldn't order the stone because relict on these stones means widow, survivor of. Here we are in June, 1799, this time two pairs of stones um, for a brother and a sister in Framingham. And here, Spalding details a separate price for carving the poetry. 67 cents. He does this often, but not always. Um, in fact, on the Abigail Merriam's order we just saw, he makes no mention of the charge for the poetry, though he did do two lines. And he is maddeningly, for my purposes, silent on what that poetry is and where it came from. Uh, I could shake him across the centuries. None of the poetry he carved is identified or quoted in this book. Now here's the temple stone, what one of the two pairs uh, in the Church Hill Cemetery in Framingham. So you'll notice by the way, his trade extended beyond Concord to Carlisle, uh, Pepperell, Framingham, Lincoln. As you may have noticed, this is the exact same epitaph as Abigail Merriam a couple of years earlier. I have found these lines all over New England. This introduces yet another category, the one I call recurring but unattributed. Epitaphs that appear across many miles and many years, but for which I have not been able to determine an original author or source text. They're everywhere. I could give you dozens of examples. Uh, Death is a debt to nature due, which I have paid and so must you, or afflictions sore a long time I bore, physicians were in vain. That even shows up in Dickens' David Copperfield, parenthetically. They're like the dandelions of my collecting. They were evidently printed, broadly distributed, and widely read across New England. Ephraim Merriam and Josiah Temple might have known it. Then again, so might Ithamar. It's just not possible to tell, they're so ubiquitous. He used it a lot. Here's another instance, the by Spalding back in Concord. It also appears in Concord on stones by several different carvers. So it's not like it was a house specialty of his. You can understand its popularity as an epitaph. 
It provides a nice, simple, hopeful message to surviving friends. Don't worry, don't be sad. I must lie in this grave a while, but then the resurrection will follow. I like the use of the word retire. The deceased is not saying farewell uh, from some great height up in heaven. Rather, she's right here. She's telling her friends to go home. There's nothing more you can do. Let me show you one more example from the account book. Mr. Reuben Hunt, uh, in May 1797, uh, commissioning a stone for his wife. Uh, again, we can see Spalding's other businesses, uh, renting his carriage to Jonas Flint, um, right here to, to Cambridge uh, and Boston in a carriage, um, a gr making a grindstone for Stephen Minot and laying bricks for Captain Buttrick. Now, let's go out to the Old Hill Burying Ground to see how this order turned out and to talk about a few other examples of Spalding's work. And here's Rebecca's Hunt's finished stone in Hill Cemetery. Certainly well worth $9.60. I think it must be another bespoke epitaph. Listen to the terrific distinctive voice of the author here as he eulogizes her Christian virtues. You can read it here. Her virtues societal, conjugal, parental, and Christian commanded respect, rejoiced acquaintance, sweetened life, consoled in sickness, made a friend of death, and confirmed the hope of celestial glory. Now notice how the author states in no uncertain terms his intentions in carving this. This inscription perpetuates her memory and invites imitation. He's calling us to act in our own interest by imitating her virtues. And then comes the closing rhyme. Frail man, give ear. The dearest joys of earth resign. Secure those joys which are divine. The message is familiar, but it's memorably expressed. Listen up, you frail sinner. Turn away from the unsubstantial joys of earth, however dear they are to you and concentrate on securing the joys to come. Now let's take a look at a couple of other Spalding stones here in the cemetery. This is the Samuel Kilby stone. He died April 17th, 1796 at the age of 73. Uh, I think on this stone, Spalding is actually showing off a little bit. Uh, notice the two shoulders before the tympanum. That's quite unusual. Usually at most you'd see one shoulder. Um, the epitaph is a short quatrain. God, my Redeemer, lives, and often from the skies looks down and watches all my dust till he shall bid it rise. This is another passage from Isaac Watts. It's actually the last verse of the same hymn that was on the Lucy Porter stone, which is just two stones away. Um, I suspect a family relationship. In this case, we don't need to know the whole hymn in order to get the positive, uplifting message uh, that God, we are assured, is watching us and the resurrection is to come. Here's another example of a wonderful long eulogy that ends with a short passage from scripture. Like the Rebecca Hunt stone, um, we're given a long list of Abigail Brown's virtues. In fact, let me read them aloud so you can hear the wonderful cadence of the language. Uh, she died, by the way, in 1794 at the age of 84. She excelled in the virtues of a good wife, parent, and neighbor, and more in those of a Christian. Being meek and lowly in heart, she was pious without affectation and charitable without ostentation. She had imbibed large of the spirit of Christ, which rendered her very amiable, useful, and respectable, and assures us she hath entered into rest. Again, I love that sense of assurance uh, of the rewards of a life well lived. The last line, reader, go thou and do likewise. 
is from the parable of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel according to Luke, where Christ instructs the lawyer who's been asking him questions to go forth and serve his neighbors. Here, whoever chose this epitaph has explicitly added us, the reader, into the scene. We are the ones being instructed by Christ to go forth and serve our neighbors. This is a perfect example of the didactic nature of these epitaphs. They were meant to be read seriously. We can end our little tour with the Thomas Hosmer stone. Thomas Hosmer died January 1787 at the age of 84. And he just has a one line epitaph. Life, how short, eternity, how long. This is not unique to Spalding or Hosmer. You find it a lot in these old cemeteries. And while it may sound a little trite to our modern ears, I think it neatly summarizes one of the most important religious and philosophical realities of its time. One that was constantly weighing on the minds of every one of Ithamar Spalding's customers and every one of Thomas Hosmer's surviving family and neighbors. Before finishing, let me return one more time to Spalding's account book. On the very last pages, Spalden added a catalog of the books he owned as of 1795. You can just read that in the corner. A list of books belonging to Ithamar Spalden, 1795. It's really an impressive list, including Lawrence Stern's novel, Tristram Shandy, Lord Chesterfield's Principles of Politeness, something called the authentic key to masonry. No surprise, uh, Spalding was a Freemason. Thomas Paine's Age of Reason, a book called Female Policy Detected, whatever that is, I'll have to research that. Uh, Samuel Johnson's famous dictionary and a cookbook amongst others. I'd actually love to know most about this last one called Valuable Secrets. Sounds enticing. So Spalding was clearly a literate, well-read man, uh, but there is not a single volume listed here that would have been a source of epitaph verse that he might have recommended to customers. No Watts, no Pope, no anthology of epitaphs, no collection of po exemplary poetry. Uh, I would have been very grateful if I had found such a book listed here and I have found in the uh, probate records of other carvers, occasional such books. But actually the absence in its own way is helpful to my research. Uh, what can we conclude about Spalding's role in choosing these epitaphs that he carved? As we've seen, his output contains a mix of commonly recurring verses, different renditions of the classic, of Watts hymns and obviously bespoke uh, verses, each with its own individual style and tone. Spalding was certainly familiar with the same general body of devotional uh, poetry as his customers and rival carvers. As a tradesman, I'm sure he kept an eye out for ideas for texts in books and almanacs and on other carver's stones. Some carvers I've, I've deduced have a house stock of epitaphs that are unique to their shop, but those are quite rare and I see no evidence of it for Spalding. At the end of the day, uh, I think he was a busy small businessman with multiple lines of work. And for the most part, I suspect he was primarily an order taker, happy to be handed a poetry commission from the survivor's own reading or their commonplace books, some Watts passage they'd circled in their hymnal as a favorite. And this very much fits with the overall picture of my research paints of the other carvers I've studied. I will say, Anka, that Ithamar Spalding's book has gone a very long way to bringing their world to life for me. And I'm very grateful for the time you uh, let me study it uh, in, your, in your room. If anyone has any questions or comments, I would welcome them. This is the URL of my website where you can send me an email. Uh, and of course, please feel free to order my 
to pre-order my upcoming book uh, from McFarland or from your favorite independent bookseller. Thank you, Anko. Thank you, John. Um, it was such a pleasure um, learning more about um, Concord Stone Carver, Ithmar Spalden, in part through this wonderful account book um, that we have here in special collections at the Concord Free Public Library, and, um, and to view also examples of his, his craftsmanship and artistry, um, especially his grave markers at Concord's Old Hill Burying Ground. Um, that was a wonderful special insight um, into his work. Um, as you note on your website, there are numerous books, articles, and related organizations for those who wish to explore this topic further. And as you already did on this slide, I invite you to visit John's website um, for a list of resources, including his, his guide to reading early epitaphs and also his insightful blog. Special Collections is also a great resource for learning about cemeteries in Concord, including the grave marker data from the South Bearing Ground and Old Hill Bearing Ground, which you can view on our website. And of course, we have information about other web cemeteries as well, including Sleepy Hollow. So again, thank you, John, for joining us today. And congratulations on the soon to be published book um, reading the gravestones of old New England. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Concord Free Public Library and the Concord Free Public Library Corporation for sponsoring this series. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Concord Stories. And I look forward to seeing you next time.